the purpose of this meeting is um, that well, is, is, is we've got an NEC, uh, Unison NEC election coming up. Ballots start on the on Tuesday, on the, on the fourth, and um, really we're, we're, we're honoured to have Paul come back to talk to LLA. He's Oh, that's that's yeah, we should mute people, really. I'm just going to go around to mute people, I think. Okay, thank you. No, uh, no, no problem. Not, not yeah. muted already. Yeah. So, so the general secretary campaign that, that Paul Paul was the grassroots candidate, and it's really it really energised our union's uh, grassroots activity uh, activists like no campaign before it. Um, many candidates who are standing now in this important NEC election share Paul's vision for a truly member-led union. And, uh, and, and, and if this uh, slate, this 56 member slate, which is, which is really impressive, 56 people all wanting to stand, if they're elected, they're going to be seeking uh, trans to transform Unison into a fighting democratic and accountable force. Um, these candidates are following through on Paul's campaign manifesto, the energy of that campaign. And, and what this campaign is about, uh, obviously, we Paul got a really high percentage of the vote, nearly won. Um, but the turnout for the Unison General Secretary election was quite, well, very low, 11%. And I think that says something about uh, the disconnect between the, the union bureaucracy and the members. And really this campaign's a bit of, it's a, it's a juggernaut where uh, these candidates are following through on Paul's campaign manifesto. And, and it's about giving the union back to its members. It's about making sure we have a campaigning union for its members. Uh, this is what Unison was about when it originally started. And, it, and, 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 and this campaign is about reclaiming, reclaiming the union. Um, so the idea is, is that, that, that this NEC will hold the new General Secretary to account, it will back its members, back its branches, make sure that those branches are properly funded, make sure that the Unison has a strong voice, not just with national policy making, but perhaps more importantly, enabling more local campaigns and grassroots activism. So all the people that are standing alongside Paul have a strong track record, but also Paul's campaigners galvanized inspired many new people to stand for the NEC so all what everyone has in common in it is is that they're all really determined and, and committed to make sure the union's working on behalf of its members um, so LA, LLA supporters coming today know firsthand we've all got the bitter experience now of uh, how the state can thwart our chances of a socialist government. And if we look around the world in places like Bolivia, if we look at our working class history, we're not gonna have socialism handed to us on a plate without a mass movement of working class people behind it. So getting a unison NEC working on behalf of its members would definitely be a, a major step towards building that movement. And, and at the end of the meeting, uh, we'll be discussing how you people involved in this call uh, watching uh, on Facebook can help getting uh, involved in this important campaign. So I'd like to hand over to Paul now and, uh, and, and, and tell us more about that and then we'll take some questions if that's okay, Paul. Thank you very much, Jay. Um, my name is Paul Holmes. I was a candidate in the General Secretary election and the vote we got in that election, and I always say we, I never say me, the vote we got in that election was the highest vote ever obtained, percentage vote by, by a lay member. And we could have won that election if circumstances had been quite different. We certainly won it on the enthusiasm. We certainly won it on the manifesto. And, and because of the sort of COVID crisis, the, the, there are normally a dozen to 15 campaign meetings where we go to during the campaign. But in this time, in 2020, there were 51 because, you know, we could hold a meeting in the Shetland Islands without actually having to go there. So of them 51 Hustings meetings, I attended 45. The only reason I didn't attend the other six was to stay with meetings were at the same time. Somebody had to speak on my behalf because the meetings were, were at the same time. And the four key things that were in our pledge, one was to give more money to the branches. One was to make the union act like the big union that it is. One is to have more officials elected. And one is to have the union run by the lay officials which is what the rule book says, that the elected officials will run the union, which is not the case. 
And, and then it, quite interesting in the hustings meet, I suppose there were a fifth one, which was the workers' wage that I vowed to go on my current wage of 32,000, not the general secretary's wage of 138,000. And the key issue I, I thought was that in them hustings meetings, my campaign agenda became the agenda. That's where the debates took place. And if you didn't move towards that agenda, then you would get a hard time from the ranchers. So, you know, at a, an NEC meeting, that you know, you wouldn't go to an NEC meeting in unison without the following two statements being made by somebody senior in the union. One, that unison is the best union in the world, which I don't know what the, the, the yardstick is for measuring that. And one is that when unison needs to get an advantage over its competitors, and its competitors, according to the leadership, are the other unions. And, and, and that, didn't, that didn't cut any ice in the hustings meetings. They want to know how to organise. They want to know what our relationship with the Labour Party is. They want to know, and I, this is an example people, for people who've been active. If you take the branch that I'm in, Kirk Lees. When I became the branch secretary 31 years ago, when we've got 10,000 members, it's a branch based on Roosevelt, Dewsbury and Valley. We've got 10,000 members. When I became branch secretary, we had four employers in the branch and 90% of the branch members would work for the council. Now we've got 404 employers and that would be repeated if you went to any big local government branch, Manchester, Birmingham, West Sussex, Bristol, they would give you the same figures. Some would go up to five or six hundred. And, and what's happened is, and this is why these elections are so important really, is we've had the introduction in the last 15 to 20 years of what the Americans refer to as business unionism, which is um, that it's about what, how much money we collect and how much money's in the bank. And, and I've never believed in that. And there were a, one of the great, best books I've ever read was by a bloke called Tony Mizuchi, who was a, an org organizer for the Oil Workers Union in the 1980s and 1990s in, in New York. And he said, unions are not measured by what assets they've got or the wages of their employees, but how they represent the economic interests of their members. And I have that in my head the whole time. You know, um, you know we keep getting told at the meeting that we've got £126 million in reserves, that the two, the two buildings on the Euston Road in London are worth over £100 million. But by and large, the members have had a torrid time since certainly since 2008 and if i give you a couple of statistics and i never mention other individuals it's not bothered it's not personal attack type issue i don't believe in that but it you know if i give you an example from 1997 to 2015 we never had a tory government there were 18 years 13 years of labor government and then five years of uh, uh, a coalition government and when the Tories won the 2015 election at the first National Executive Council meeting afterwards, there was quite a long motion from the leadership of the union put to the NEC about 15 points how we need to organise under a new Tory government after 18 years. And point seven or point eight said we need to recruit more members. It's quite a laudable objective. And somebody, one of the NEC members who was standing on the slate this time from... from the Northwest moved an amendment so it read we need to recruit more members and more stewards and it got beaten 31-24. They voted that they didn't want to recruit any more stewards and that gives you a picture really of where the union has, has gone towards in the in the last 10 or 15 years. Now Unison as it com says in all its literature is the biggest union in Britain well, it is in terms of the number of members it's got, but our members wouldn't know that it's the biggest union in Britain. You know, there, there were a survey done by the TUC, uh, can't worry, one out, around about 2009, 2010. And, yeah, just uh, and the less than 10% of members knew the general secretary was, whereas in the RMT, 98% of the members knew that, that Bob Crow was the general secretary. And it, one of the big things I kept plugging away and got a big echo on in the election was that we don't appear in the media. We're not a big player. You wouldn't think we had 1.4 million members. We don't fight as weight. And, you know, it's a well-known fact 
that between 2001 and 2021, the largest public sector union in Britain never appeared on Question Time once, turned down invite after invite after invite. And, and we, don't, we didn't appear in hardly any media outlets. And, and, and we, we don't act big. We act about collecting money. And, and I think that came to a head, really, in, in the sort of 2015-16 with, with the election of, of Corbyn as the leader. Now, of the Labour Party, Corbyn was an ex, is, in, is a unit member, is an ex full time official of Newby, one of the, the predecessor unions. And we balloted our members twice in the two elections that were for leader on the, who they wanted the union to, rep, to represent them as the leader of the Labour Party. And both times our members will pay the Labour Party affiliation within Unison, and that's about somewhere just over 400,000, voted for Corbyn. Now, when the election subsequent to the 2019 general, uh, general election took place, that didn't happen. Within two or three days of the announcing of who the candidates were, we had nominated Keir Starmer without any consultation. And that's when the hammer comes. The hammer comes, well, not that who have we nominated, but how did we nominate? And I think democracy is a big thing. And however you voted in the EU referendum, and there's a variety of people uh, voted a variety of ways, I can tell you from my personal experience of being a working class person in a working class town, that a town that voted 57% to leave, I can tell you nothing annoyed people, working class people who voted leave, more than being talked down to about being stupid. Because I'm a believer in democracy. And what I believe in is people have a right to be wrong. They have that right. They have a right to vote against some of the time, but they have a right to be wrong. And what politics is increasingly um, dominated by is soulless individuals who have no policies, who put forward nothing campaigning that inspires anybody, and forever thinking how it affects their career. Not how does it affect the members? You know, I'm a firm believer that, you know, the, the, the audit that needs, is of importance is not the assets of the buildings we own and the salaries of the staff. It's the pensions, terms and conditions and job security of our members. That's the only audit that matters. And what's been interesting, what the General Secretary election campaign were extremely, extremely successful. Loads of people came on board who perhaps might not have supported me at the beginning. And the issue of having a lay candidate is quite interesting because as far as I'm aware, and I don't interfere in other unions elections, but you know, the two favorites in the Unison General Secretary election were both full-time officers, only elected full-time officers. And as far as I'm aware, the three front runners in the Unite General Secretary election would fulfill the same criteria. Now, that's not true of the campaigns we want to run. And that's why when we got towards the end of the General Secretary campaign, after the, the election had finished, but before um, we knew the result, there was a bit of a clamor really from the, from the people that we should transfer the energy and the enthusiasm and the ability of the campaign for general secretary into the NEC elections. Now, the NEC general secretary election takes place every five years, uh, 2010, 2015, 2020. The NEC elections take place every two years. They're due to take place uh, starting Tuesday, the 4th of May to Friday, the 27th of May. And on the NEC, there are 68 seats and they fit in into three categories and I bet 98% of the members don't understand how they work. But of the, of the 68 seats, these are rough numbers, I've got them in front of me, but something like 42, the union is split into 12 regions, uh, Scotland, Northern Ireland, Wales, the Northwest, Yorkshire, etc. And in each region, you have between three and five NEC members based on the number of members in that region that comes to about 42. And then, there are seven groups that Unison split into of work groups like health or universities or local government or police. And they elect about 17 from their groups, depending on the size. And then there are 10 seats that are, sorry, eight seats that are elected national seats. 
were four of her black members, um, four of her, uh, sorry, two of her disabled members and two of her young members were candidature is restricted to people fit into that description. So if you were a member, for example, working for Manchester City Council, you'll probably have between 16 or 17 votes in the National Executive Council elections. Um, you, if, if you're under 27, you would have five North West seats to vote for, four local government seats to vote for, four black members, two young members, two disabled members. So the, the ballot paper itself is confusing because it's hard for the members to get their head around that. It's hard to campaign in the elections with any material. We've got postcards all over the country now that try and explain where people can vote and who they can vote for. And people, you know, people can remember that, you know, if they've been to a meeting or they've heard a Zoom meeting or whatever, or I liked Paul Holmes or I liked one of the other candidates. But trying to remember 16 or 17 candidates is very difficult. So that's why, you know, we've got a, a really good media campaign. What shocked everybody is that, that in the general secretary election for Unison, full-time officers can, can take part in the election and can campaign, but they can't in the National Executive Council elections. And what shocked everybody about the general secretary election was that our media campaign, which was run by amateurs, was run by people doing it in their spare time, was far and away the best media campaign in the general secretary election even though professional officers who do it for a living could do that in, in the general secretary election. And the, even though any full-time officer of the union could come out in favour of any of the five candidates, not one of the employees came out in favour of me. So in the NEC elections, the full-time officers can't take place in the elections. They basically supervise the elections and are sort of independent officers in the ranches. Uh, We've gone through two of the, th the four main periods. One was the period to get nominations, uh, where branches can nominate, and that's gone and, and, and it's finished. One is, you know, candidates can write their own election address, which they've done in the closing date, but that's gone. So there's only two things to go then. One is the social media campaign, which is ongoing, which ours is really good. And the other is the sort of leafleting campaign as the election goes on. And I'll answer questions on that. but. It's quite restrictive about, um, it's a lot easier to campaign for somebody if your branch has nominated them. Within a branch, a branch can send out to its members saying why they nominated somebody if they nominated them. They can't indicate any preference if they didn't nominate them. And people can themselves individually get involved, but organisations from outside the union can't. People have to do it as individual units and members. So we're in a, a crucial election now. You know. Unison is not particularly well admired by a lot of people in the other unions, in the Labour Party. But what is interesting this time, and it's the first time it's ever happened, I've been elected seven times to the NEC now, this is the eighth time I've stood. Uh, what is interesting is, and I've never known it before, the amount of involvement from people in the Labour Party and Labour councillors, at least three or four of our candidates are Labour councillors, which would never have happened and, but it, it does show you something, really, that actually there's a level of ignorance about uni, Unison within the Labour Party members and Labour councillors who are Unison members. A lot of people are active in the Labour Party as councillors or whatever, but are Unison members because of their job, because they work in the lo local government or an FP college or whatever, but not particularly active in Unison. And what we found in the General Secretary election was people were finding it had to get involved because they couldn't understand the structure of Unison. But now that wouldn't be true. You know, when the NUM were a big union in, in Yorkshire, you know, in the late 70s, early 80s, I knew thousands of people in the NUM and they all knew how the NUM worked and the relationship with the Labour Party. They don't necessarily know that in, in, in Unison. You know, we've had people coming forward as candidates who are, are Labour councillors as candidates for the NEC who don't understand the structure of Unison at all. So what's facing us now, and this is the key to these elections really, the split on the NEC is something like 39-28. That's what the split is at this, at this moment in time. But we're moving into a period now where the, there's four things going to happen. Fire and rehire is going to be massive, absolutely massive. 
um, which is where employers issue a section 188 redundancy notice to you and say, look, we're giving you the period of your notice, which is normally 12 weeks, it can be less than that. We're giving you a period of notice, and on the at the end of that period, you can either continue working for us on worse terms and conditions, or you can leave with that redundancy. And that's perfectly legal in this country. And that is going to be a massive issue. That's what's happened at Tower Hamlets Council, to Labour Council. That's what's happened to British Gas. That's what they're trying to do with British Airways. That's what they're doing on the buses. They're trying to get, you know, a lot of bus companies, I know it from personal experience, will have workers on three or four levels of pay, depending on when they started. Some will be on protected pay, et cetera, et cetera. And there's a big dispute going on now. At a company. It's nothing to do with economic well-being. A company called Duva Egbert who make coffee, make lots of varieties of coffee in, in Banbury, in Oxfordshire. Well, they, they're, they're in the middle of having a Section 188 notice on and the employer's threatening fire and rehire. And that's a company that because of COVID and lockdown has had a 41% increase in its turnover and a 9% increase in its profit. So it's nothing to do with the economic well-being of the COVID. It's just taking advantage of the situation. And I was talking to John McDonnell the other day and he said, oh, I've just come from a parliamentary debate on fire and rehire. And the only Tory there was the minister. There was nobody else on the Tory side other than the minister. They're not interested or they're interested not in debating it. So, you know, that is what, and over the last 12 months, it's a shocking statistic, this, but over the last 12 months, 5%, sorry, 9% of British workers have had the pay and conditions reduced. And 18% of workers under 25 have had the pay and conditions reduced. And that is the, what we're heading towards, fire and rehire. We've got the issue, issue of the budgets, where in the last two or three years, two councils have gone technically bankrupt, Croydon in Surrey and North Hampshire County Ranch. And the Financial Times are estimating that between 10 and 20 councils could go bankrupt over the next period. We've got the 1% pay offer in the health service and the pay sector freeze in the rest of the public services. We've got threats of redundancies. And we've got a government that, if you believe the media, is cock a hoop and popular. But that's not what I hear when I'm talking to people. And to be honest, it's a, it's a side debate, really. But who's pulled the government through is the National Health Service, both in the treatment of COVID. And the vaccination program that that was pulled the government through in publicity terms but but it isn't going to last when all this fire and rehire and redundancies comes forward the unison has two seats on the labor party's national executive and how unison is organized very few labor party members would know this there are something like thirty thousand labor party members in unison but you can't get to find out who they are and i as a a political fund officer in our branch. I can't find out who the Labour Party members are in, in my, my branch. I know there are 200, but I only know 29 of them are. It's very, there's no connection, there's no cord between the members and the, uh, the Labour Party members and Unison's work in the Labour Party. The, the, the connection is far more full-time officers talking to council leaders than it is a, an active base between the, between the two. And that's got to change. And I think that's why, you know, the, the frustration about Corbyn being suspended, et cetera, et cetera, has come over into some of the work in unison now. And, you know, as I say, we've got two seats on the Labour Party. Most people won't know this, but the, our Labour Party connection is run by the Labour Link Committee of Unison, which co consists of 12 people, one elected from each region, and 12 people appointed by the National Executive. They run it. They made the nomination for Starmer uh, in, in the the Labour leadership election. So what the people standing on the Time for Real Change slate want to do, I think it fits into three categories, really. One is give more support to branches. At the moment, 23% of the funds go to the branches. And that's where 90% of the work is. You know, there's a massive job to be done. If you speak to anybody in, in a branch about the community care sector, the private care sector, the private sector, it's completely unorganised. We collect money in, we collect subscriptions in, but we don't campaign for trade union recognition, discipline. You know, every branch secretary will tell you when somebody gets disciplined in these private care homes, you say, well, can I have a copy of the disciplinary procedure? There isn't one. Well, we don't recognise you anyway. You know, so th there's the massive job 
basic trade union job to be done for that. One is, is a massive job to recruit young members. Young members are anti-union. They just want to know what a union is going to do for them. And we've only got in the union less than 60,000 people under 27. So 1.8% of the membership is under 27 at this moment in time, which is a phenomenally bad statistic for the union. And the, the next thing is the pay. You know, people are struggling. If you did it, see surveys now about food banks, work in, work, in work poverty. You know, we had a situation in local government two or three years ago where we had to have an emergency meeting of the national pay negotiations because the lowest pay rate in local government, which was mainly for cleaners and um, school dinner workers, fell below the national minimum wage. We had to have an urgent meeting to give them 5p an hour rise so that we weren't paying an illegal wage rate in Labour councils. And it's just unbelievable, absolutely unbelievable. And what this, can, I'll bring remarks to a conclusion really, this is a massive, massive opportunity. We've got 56 candidates standing in this election uh, and they've got a lot to bring to the table. Anybody that's seen any of the regional rallies we've had, chaired by John McDonnell, and we've got a national rally tomorrow night, not tomorrow night, uh, Tuesday night, uh, chaired by John McDonald with Ken Loach speaking as well. We'll have seen the talent on offer. And that's, that was part of my general secretary campaign. I think we've had 42 of the candidates speaking at the regional rallies. And part of my general secretary campaign was, look, the talent's there. What there's too much of is somebody looking at the talent and thinking, is that person going to vote for me or not vote for me? Do they fit in? Well, I'm not interested in that. You know, I'm interested in, is there somebody else who wants to join the team who's got something to contribute? And the other part of it, and I think it's equally as important, is the, the, mem the stewards and the reps need to know that the union's got their back. That if they do stick their head out campaigning in the public sector, that, you know, about hospital closures or library closures or whatever it is, then somebody in the union will back them up. It's really important. I remember speaking on a picket line in Huddersfield in 1989 with a leading official of the NUR in the region, the National Union of Railway Workers, and he had a paper bag over his head with two holes cut in his eyes and the mouth because he were a disciplinary offence to, to speak against the policies of the railways. That's a nationalised industry with a Labour government. Uh, sorry, we a Tory government at the time, sorry, but the, it, the, the, the legislation had been there under a Labour government, hadn't been removed. And if there's two things happening now in councils, one and in the public sector, one is increasingly activists are getting disciplined by employers. And the other is that the attacks are raining down and we're talking about competitors. Now, we had a massive dispute in our branch, big strike three years ago of the bins. Bing, bins is a big thing in local councils, you know. And, and one of the things about the bins is, if you want to cut your libraries by 10%, you can. If you want to cut um, your park staff by 10%, you can. But it's difficult to cut your bin staff because there's nobody volunteering not to have the bin emptied. You, you were not going to win an election on, we're going to empty 10% less, 10 less bins. It'll be a nightmare. If people don't... The, the job from hell in councils is the complaints phone on the bins. You know, if somebody had the bin emptied, the phone's straight on, straight away. And increasingly now, but they're all over Britain, bin strikes, all over Britain. And one thing that I know as a branch secretary, and any union as a branch secretary would know this, is that bin workers are in more than one union. It often depends on where that local authority was 25 years ago, you know, when it would be a different restructure. And, you know, the GMB and Unite and Unison, there'll be, in, in, on most bin departments, all them three unions will have members. I think it would be really unusual if they didn't. So talking about competitor unions and competitors takes us absolutely nowhere. And there's a, there's a whole series of bin disputes taking place. And because you can't shut the bins, you can't say, I'm not, elect, I'm not uh, removing 10% of the bin. There's only two ways to deal with it, as far as the employers are concerned. One, one is you can speed the bin collection up by getting them running around faster and faster. 
And the other is you can bully them, threaten them. And, and that is the atmosphere. It's an electric atmosphere on most in most bins now. I'm telling you now, so you know, over the next period, there'll be bin strikes all over Britain because they're at the end of the tether. And that brings me to me, I've come full circle, really. The general secretary election campaign gave us hope. It gave us hope. I hate this. We want, you know, that you're lucky to have a job. That's the Tories mantra, isn't it? Of the last 40 years, you're lucky to have a job. We're not lucky to have a job. They're lucky to have the amount of money that they've got. We're not lucky to have a job. And what working people are being told now is you have to do that job faster, with less people, on worse terms and conditions. And the one that's coming in local government is, again, they're seeking to cut the pensions. They're not seeking to cut it, cut it for the bosses, but they'll be seeking to cut it for ordinary working people. And that's what these elections are absolutely vital elections and I, one of my slogans during this election i don't want to be cheap about it has been the time has come you know if you were a black person in the united states you might be shocked by the treatment of george floyd but you will have seen similar things in your lifetime but sometimes something comes you know it's like the, the recent movement about violence against women Sometimes an incident, the time comes, he's ready for it. And I think in unison, the time's come to change the composition of the national. Most of our members are cynical about the, the objectives of the union. And, and I am in, in this, this collecting money. A couple of minutes, Paul. Thank you very much. In this collecting money and having assets, what I think is that I don't care if we've got no money in the bank. I don't care if we've got no assets as long as we defended the members. Because if we do that, the money will come back in twofold. And so these elections are important. I want you to get involved with them as Unison members, but I'm, I'm happy to answer questions about anything. Thank you very much, Chair. That's brilliant, absolutely brilliant. I think uh, this is streaming out uh, on, this is streaming out on Facebook at the moment and people are getting involved who, who aren't in the Zoom live on Facebook and I think there's captions coming up and I think if we uh, transcribed all that there, there you've got it that that's what's got that that's the whole that's all of it pretty all-encompassing really um so um there's so much to pick up on there uh, but I think what's the bigger picture is, is what's coming through loud and clear is is that the what we're facing when the biggest recession I don't know since the Great Depression that that was that that was already in place before Covid and, and I think what was really something, just one thing I want to pick up on, you said, Paul, is about uh, firing me higher, unscrupulous companies who uh, don't need to make more money, taking advantage of this. And, and the austerity, I think there's already 15 billion planned cuts for the NHS, which is absolutely disgusting. We've been clapping. Have we lost Ross? I think no. he's just frozen, isn't he? Are you back, Ross? There he is again. Yeah, sorry, my connection is a bit unstable. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah, sorry about that. So, yeah, we'll, we'll pass over to the question. So the point is the austerity that's coming down the line is going to make the austerity we've had for the last 10 years an estimated 300,000 people dead before COVID look like a walk in the park. This austerity that's coming down the line is going to be ruthless and brutal. So... We have to stand together and we are standing together and I, I have reason to un, uh, understand that these, this, this firing Harry strike one in Manchester is going really well, going absolutely really well. So, so you know, we, we, we will defeat fire and rehire. Um, so I'll bring some questions in anyway. I'd, um, I think Matthew had his hand up first. I know uh, Steve Price had a question. I know Margaret had a question as well. Um, let me know if you if, if if that's okay if I can bring you three in, but I'll, I'll go with uh, Matthew first. Okay. Okay. Uh, thanks, guys. No, Matthew Jones. I work in the energy industry, um, and um, the thing was obviously that the, the problem we really got, of course, uh, there's there's a whole series of issues. Um, I mean, first of all, the 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 union the Unison actually signed the fire and rehire. In British gas, which is like you know, pointing a dagger at the rest of us, you know, putting a big target on us. Okay, British gas have done it. 
so 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 what about everybody else you know um surrenders really is you know and the fact that wasn't then come you know the whole you know the gnm were left to, to fight by themselves and so on and, and the whole thing's you know been been forced through you know it's 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 big i mean i was at my uh, uh, and, and it also there's a you know it was talking about the number of employers i mean the thing is that of course what the employers have done uh, overall of course is to outsource as much as they can i mean where, where i where i work i mean we you know we've probably got you know we've got one building and one we all work, work essentially for one company but we've probably got about 20 or 30 employers um and and i was at my union agm the, the secretary branch secretaries you know old guy who's you know again a labor party member complaining about the lack of members and the problem is the problem is of course what the what the company did was to was to outsource all the call centers all, all this other stuff to, to all these little to all these outfits you know which of course saved them an enormous amount of money in terms of of, of, of wages pensions etc etc but removed all, all, all you know the, the, the bulk of the members of unison from the company <laughs> and the problem is of course now you've got all these these people who are not on it organized who are facing these rapacious um employers who don't want them organized and uh, and you've got i mean you talk about the lack of young members I mean, the problem is the union then has to uh, has to be able to fight its way through these rapacious employers who employ people on precarious conditions zero hour contracts uh, and 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 don't want to to to, to deal with unions and, and unison simply has not been prepared to fight those kind of those kind of uh, employers which is why all of that's gone through these small unions which are not part of the tuc i mean actually most of the battles been done by the iwgb and various bits of the uh, iww um you know because they're prepared to actually do that fighting you know and the, the, the you know the if if comrades remember some years ago of course was the whole case of the london cleaners and of course started off organizing in use and quickly discovered that unison were not prepared to do anything at all in fact wish, wish to remove themselves from the uh, from the struggle as rapidly as possible and therefore the cleaners themselves were forced to go to another organization or to fight the employers um and and, and it's actually to reverse that because if you want to organize young people that's how you're going to have you know you're going to have to actually fight down and dirty in the trenches against these vicious employers who are not you know going to concede anything without a, a, a very serious fight and and some some major resources i mean some of the unions have put resources in i know i know unite here in glasgow have put in some quite made some serious resources and got they had some success um although not not huge you know but 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 some and, and they've actually built some kind of of a base you know in terms of hospitality and so on but i mean you know the union has to get has to get into that field otherwise you know that's the way it's going and, and the other thing, of course, is going to be, is going to, as, 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 as Paul was saying, is local governments. I mean, here, I mean, obviously, what's happening now, of course, under the, the, with the, the excuses of the pandemic, of course, is that the the the, um, the councils are taking the excuse to get rid of as many services as possible. I mean, here, um, say for instance, our uh, um, Glasgow Life, which runs most of the, the council's uh, recreational facilities, and, and has something like 74, 74 sites, is when it is now working on getting rid of at least half of those. In the next few months, you know, it's going to close a whole battery of libraries, um, swimming pools, um, you know, community centres, the whole lot. They're just going to clean everything off, you know, and say, right, okay, well, you know, we 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 haven't got any money. We're not running these anymore. If you want to run them, then you can run them yourselves. But we're not doing it. Uh, and and I mean, that's you know, it's huge. It really is a huge point. And, and, I, and I would hope there's going to be some really very serious response to that kind of crap. Thanks. Yeah, that's a, that's a brilliant contribution, Matthew. Thanks so much for kicking things off there. That, that's fantastic. So um, we'll bring in uh, Margaret and then and then Steve. Uh, so Margaret, are you there? I am. Yes. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Right. Well, first of all, thank you very much, Paul, for your uh, for the things that you were saying and your insight into what's actually going on in Unison as well. But uh, the question that I want to ask is about our national health service. Now I'm a Unite Union member and what I've done, I took a motion to our branch and it has been passed. And the motion is that will our union organize a public awareness campaign 
about the cost of treatment in our National Health Service based on a comparison with the American United States of America private health insurance. Because I think we have to get a strong message out to the people of what it's going to cost them when it's privatised, because that's where we're heading. And unions, as far as I'm concerned, have been too quiet on this subject. Because to go back in time when there was no National Health Service, when people died in agony of cancer and women died in childbirth, we do not want these days back. And I think the unions should be out there fighting for this because it's the greatest achievement in the world is our National Health Service. So that's one side of the National Health Service question. And the other one is, is about the nurses, the profession with this 1% of the government. I think the uh, Labour Party said 2%, but they won't commit themselves either way. But I've also heard that Unison have said something about £2,000 each for each, each worker, which I'm not 100% certain of. It's just like he says that. So I'd like to hear your take on, on, on what I've said and what Unison think is the right percentage for our professionals. I would go as far as to say 10%, but uh, I'd, li I'd like the answers on that, please, Paul. Thank you. Again, that's an absolutely brilliant question. Um, that, yeah, that, that, that's a fantastic question, Margaret. Um, absolutely vital, uh, the NHS fine rehiring and NHS pay. So uh, is Steve Price there? Could I bring Steve in? Hi. Can you hear me, yeah? Hello? Yes, can hear you fine, Steve. You can hear me now. Good, good, good. Okay. Well, yeah. Yeah, so, yes, uh, thanks, Paul. Um, that was... Hello? Yeah, you still there. can see you. I'm here you now. Sorry. He Sorry, well. yeah, my, my, my internet, I don't know what's going on, but it's, it's very unstable today, so bear with me if I just disappear off the call. Um, yeah, Ed, that was a really excellent, Paul, and um, I think it's sort of brilliant that, you know, so someone... As you say, a lay rep, um, rank and file uh, rep, standing as you did, and actually doing extremely well. You know, it was a really good vote. Um, very frustrating that, that there were two other left candidates uh, on the slate, um, which allowed obviously um, you know the the establishment candidate to win. And um, in fact, I, I'm in Unite, and uh, I'm afraid I can I can actually see history repeating itself. Um, because although there's a lot of talk that coin, you know, won't get on the ballot. Um, I'm in the West Midlands, I know coin, and I think it will get on the ballot and I, I can see more problems uh, with the divided left. Um, I've, I've actually put two questions in the chat and I, I, I won't ask you to respond to those now, but um, one, of the, one of the questions I asked was actually about um, why there's not really um, any significant organized broad left within unison. The way, say, within Unite, where you've got the Unite left. Uh, and I also put a question in there about, um, about the NEC, that if, uh, if the left take control of the, uh, of, the, you know, of the Unison NEC, will you replace the uh, current uh, um, two people who are sitting on the Labour Party NEC? Because um, obviously they're right wingers and it'd be good to have a couple of decent lefties on there. Um, my other general comment was really about, I mean, I, I, I agree with Peter whatever that you said, and um, you, you're right about fire and rehire. That's a big issue within Unite. Uh, it's something I'm actually involved in myself, you know, as a, as, as a lay rep. Um, but I think um, contracting out and, um, you know, the, this fragmentation of the service is such a big issue. And the part, the lay part has been talking about, uh, you know, bringing things back in house. And I think that's a that's a really big thing if, if you know if Unison can can push that as a policy, and I mean they've got the contacts with Starmer and uh, and Rayner and Co. Um, to push the Labour Party in that direction um, of actually you know strongly advocating uh, bringing stuff back in house. That's really what I wanted to say, but I'll, I'll ask you to respond to the two questions in the chat. Well. Thanks very much. That's brilliant. That's brilliant as well. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Steve. Um, so uh, I'll bring you back in, Paul, if you want to yeah. respond as you want to those three uh, contributions and questions. Thanks. Yeah, 
if we start off with the first one from, from Matthew, really, that it's funny, and I said this at meetings, in the 1926 year-long miners' strike, their slogan was, not a minute on the day, not a penny off the pay. And that, when we went to school, were like a history book slogan. And that is the slogan that could have been applied to all these fire and reality disputes. Who would have thought that they started working in the 70s and 80s that would be having disputes about elongating the working week or reducing the pay? And one of the ways they reduce pay, they want to reduce pay, is what they call flexibility and what I call getting rid of overtime rates. They want you at their beck and call and it doesn't really matter what your private life's last by. And it, it's a matter of class in it. That, 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 that's what the issue is all about. And I remember uh, going to a meeting of Unison members in, in, in Kirklees, would have been 15, 20 years ago. And these members all worked in cash offices where they collected, there were about 10 of them, where they collected money for rents and rates, allotments, all sorts of stuff like that. And these two women came up to see me after the meeting and they said, we want to join Unison. So well, it's fine, I've got application forms here. They said, but we don't want anybody to know that we've joined Unison. I says, what, you mean the people that you work with? They said, no, where we used to work. I said, well, what do you mean? She said, well, we both used to work for um, the Yorkshire, Yorkshire Electricity Board. And like, you know, the Electricity Board had showrooms all over Britain nationalised showrooms, where it dealt with your bills, but it also dealt with selling fridges and washing machines, etc. And she said that the um, service from the union, which would now go there, was so appalling but when, we, when it was shut down, that we all vowed, all ex of us in the showroom, that we would never join a union again, that, that, that now go our union again, because of how we were treated. And we've seen when we come here, that it was nothing to do with the brand name. It was to do with who was representing us. So we do want to join a union, but we don't want the we meet every month, the, the old people you were working and we don't want the others to know about it. And it tells you a tale that because you know, people going about young people don't want to join unions, which is rubbish. There's a lot of them don't know what a union is, a lot of them aren't grown up in a unionized environment. Um, I don't remember joining now though. I remember starting work and I remember having subs deducted, but I don't remember joining because everybody were in the union where I worked. But I tell you, you can't recruit. Somebody who's 52, who's a caretaker, who's been would check rubbish by the union where they worked before when the factory shut. You can't recruit them because they're anti-union for the rest of their life. They think I paid in my subs as much as I could. And then the one I wanted them, they disappeared. And, and that's what we've got to talk about. And we need victories. At the moment, what we've got is individual employers fighting against union branches who are organised, but the employers getting away with it in other areas. Well, we need national disputes. You know, fire and rehire, or the public, you know, the employer is organised nationally. Whatever the legislation says is you can't coordinate disputes. They've coordinated the 0% uh, public sector freeze. They've coordinated the use of fire and rehire, they've coordinated the 1% for all the health uh, authorities. And, and that's how it works. And we need to respond accordingly. And in the NHS, there's a fiddle going on. Because I can tell you what, you know, I agree with, with comparing what you're paying for the United States and what you pay for over here. It's well known that the United States' health system costs two or three times what any other one in the world costs. But what's equally insidious is what's going on in here in the health service. You know, I went for an operation and I refused it recently. When I'd gone to the GP, who sent me, I wanted to go to the hospital, but sent me to, the, to a, a, a private optician, who sent me to a clinic in Wakefield for an operation. And I kept saying, well, I don't know where this clinic is. I've never heard of it. And I couldn't work out where it was from the address because it was a postcode. So I went out and looked for it. And it were like, it was an industrial unit on, a, on an industrial estate. And basically they were doing NHS operations in the private sector because they'd won a contract. 
And the number of people I speak to now in private hospitals across the board who are being operated on for cancer, for eyes, knees, in private hospitals paid for by the taxpayer. And it's, I think politically, both the Labour Party and the unions need to expose that no capitalist believes in competition. Absolutely don't. They hate competition. They joke about it at university and on the courses. But what they want is untended for contracts. That's what they want. They want the business. I have never met a big business that wants to compete for that contract. And that, you know, we've seen that we through test and trace and all that that's happened in, in, in the recent COVID crisis. And then to come back, having thrown billions of private companies where you can't work out where the money's gone and how it got there, and offering 1% to people, when hundreds of NHS staff have died, they've gone through hell. The mental health toll on NHS workers must be horrific. You know, I've spoken to nurses who, in outreach, you know, might work in a, a clinic or might work out in the community, who's been deployed into COVID units where there's, there's, there's somebody dying on every shift. They've not experienced that. They've not been trained for that. You know, I spoke to this nurse the other day and she said, I spent most of um, earlier this year, most shifts are all to somebody's hand who were dying and, and helping them write a last letter to somebody that I hadn't seen. Well, I've got no training, no background in that. And it, it pays a real toll on them people. You know, we're now getting GP practices being, I think they were in Kent that I read the other day, that's gone to an American company with nearly a million patients. And it's not just the, the privatisation of it. It's them being allowed to run to win government contracts in NHS hospitals and NHS trusts that are in financial trouble thinking, at least we don't have to do all that. Because if you don't work in local government and you don't work in the public sector, you don't understand the low standard of management. And they would rather privatise something than have the responsibility of managing it. it a, it's cheaper for them, but B, it involves less work for them. You know, they, you know, and there's always somebody in the council who will write a paper justifying something. Always. Why sports centres should be run by a trust or why libraries should be run by the community. They'll put a spin on it. There's always, you know, I, I disagreed with the slogan about, um, you know, for the many, not the few, 1% against 99%. I don't think it's true. I think 1% own society. 95% work in it, and 3 or 4% are well paid to tell you that the 1% should own it. And they write reports, and the judges, and the solicitors, and their MPs, and, and they get paid very well to explain why working people can work for less, and why they should work for less. You have seen the reports that justify anything, absolutely anything. So we should, the, the, the pay claim in the health from Unison is 2,000. I think there's 15 different unions in that claim. Some people have claimed 15%, some people have claimed in between. What the interesting issue is what they get offered and then what campaign takes place to accept it or, or reject it. Now, in the, in the union after the elections, which are going to be close, the elections are going to be close, and the turnout in the general, Ross said at the beginning of the meeting, the turnout in the general secretary election was 11 he said but between 5 and 6% in the NEC elections. And in the last N NEC elections in 2019, of the 67 seats that there were then, 24 were elected unopposed. 24 people were elected unopposed. And the union, is, and the, the others are elected on a 5% turnout. And that's where the battle has to take place. You know, I've argued for years that... You know, I don't agree with postal ballots. I think that what well, the position should be really clear that we should have ballots organised by the Electoral Reform Society in conjunction with local councils, etc. that work. If there's some issue about ballot boxes, then they could be supervised. But there's, you know, I remember when the NUM would get a 95% turnout in their elections by having supervised ballot boxes at the pit of baths. The only people who didn't vote, this was a one-day election, were the people who weren't at work that day. They're the only people who didn't vote. And, you know, it's a lie when people say, oh, we want to fight not enough people in this meeting. 
but we want to fight against the low turnout. They don't. If the low turnout brings the right result. The two issues for a lot of people who don't want to change anything are stop somebody getting on the ballot paper, and if they do get on it, keep the turnout low so nobody knows there is an election. And I think that's one of the battles we've got in this election, really, is that, you know, the union has to have a public face. You know, when I was growing up in the 60s and 70s, the trade union leaders were all known by everybody. You know, they, they were public figures. You know, the TUC conference was on, like, was, like, was on television for three or four days. People discussed what they were discussing because they were discussing issues. Now, if we had a TUC conference that, that we're having realistic discussions about what's facing young people on precarious pay or no pensions, and but you don't hear it. I, I was speaking at a meeting the other day to, to young Unison members, and I said um, to my two daughters, are both in the 20s, I said, well, what do you think is the issue, most serious issue facing people under 26? And they both said the same thing, and I wouldn't have said it. Housing, definitely, unequivocally, housing. You can't get it, you can't afford it, you can't get secure tenure, you can't get a mortgage. And one of them said, look, I'm a psychiatrist on £44,000 a year, late 20s, in London, having a house share with three other people. Now, that would be a job where you think you might get some housing. So what I want to sort of bring the three questions together is the union's got to become bigger. It's got to act big. It's got to talk big. And it's got to mean something to its members. You know, at the end of the day, when somebody says to you, your overtime rate's going to be cut, or your pension, or your... there are councils in Britain now who take a week's unpaid holiday at Christmas, possibly, because of, of situations that have occurred over fire in Riyadh. Etc. So it's a massive change we're talking about in Unison. You know, because where Unison organised is where the battles are taking place. That's brilliant. Thank you, Paul. Uh, that's absolutely brilliant. Thanks very much. Um, I'll, I'll I'll abuse my position of chair and ask a, a question if that's all right. And if anyone else wants to come in or come back in for that matter, uh, that's absolutely fine as well. Um, I was, um, I, I mean, what's what's vital about what's coming out of this is, um, is really, I, th I think the theme of it, theme of the campaign is, is that it's got to happen from the bottom up. And I think one of the concerns in the Unite um, General Secretary election is, is there's a lot of uh, uh, debate going on about it but, but of course all three um candidates who are on the ballots so far are um uh, from the union bureaucracy and um wh whereas this is a different campaign and, and paul's campaign was different because paul's never taken a wage um from from uh, from unison and and i just want to sort of quote uh, someone called andrew gamble a writer who wrote that um the new revisionists have an optimistic view of the ability to use the existing state to achieve socialist objectives and that a lot of people I think still today but because we've been kept in the dark about things we, we perhaps have a pessimistic view of the potential for working class they put their hopes not in extra parliamentary class struggles but in a broad social alliance that will win an electoral majority and use the legislative machinery of the state to extend individual and social rights. And I think one of the themes that's been coming out ever since uh, the, uh, the, the defeat of the Corbyn era is a real, um, for me, it's been a real wake up call. Uh, the, 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 the state aren't going to hand us um, any kind of socialist government we want. They're, they're just not gonna do it. And I think Paul's right to, draw attention to that rather um, glib idea about the 1%, the 99%, because we need to um, think a bit more about that and think about the state and, and think about the, these other percent of people who tell us what to do and keep keep ourselves uh, in, keep people in the dark. So my question to Paul, uh, before we bring some other people in, is um, the extent to which uh, unions, union leaders, 
need to be concerned with the Labour Party and legislative processes in order to achieve change and the extent to which we focus on uh, uh, material struggles from the, from the bottom up. Um, Do you want me to turn to that now? Or? Um, well, actually, I'd just like to... Uh, well, let me just have a look. If I just bring Steve Price right. back in, just to mention his, his other questions, just to remind us, remind you, Paul, and then you come back in if that's all right. Yeah, fine, yeah. Hi. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Good. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, it's, I, I do apologise. My internet is just so shit today. I'm on my phone now. I was on, I was on my PC before. But yeah, I put two questions in the chat, Paul, that um, I think are perhaps of interest. And I wonder if you'd reply to them. The one, the one was about, um, you know, there's the fact that there isn't, although it's a very big union, Unicef, there isn't really an organised broad left in right. the way that, say, there is within Unite, and why is that, and is anything going to be done about it? And the second question was about the um, the Labour NEC, because at the moment, Unison has a couple right. of people on the NEC. Um, if the left take control of Unison NEC, will you will you put two lefties on the NEC for me, please? That's it. That's great. Thank you very much, Steve. So if you could bring it back in, Paul. Thanks. Yeah, I apologise. I can't see the chat box, Jess, so... But I did. I did write down that I am answering your question about the broad left organisation. Would we'll have come back to that later. Um, there has been a broad left organisation in in Unison for some time now, but it it were it were a bit like a club where you had to pass tests. So we ended up standing a slate of people in uh, 2017. I think it were 41 people, and as I said to you earlier, there were 24 people elected unopposed then and, and not one of them were on our slate so you know you were 20 you were coming out to play in a football match you were 24 nil down before the kickoff really so what's come out of this election for the general secretary i think we had at the 12 region in the 12 region something in excess of 350 individuals who were doing things physically doing coordinating and activating things in the in the uh, general secretary election and that's what it needs to be built on. It is, it is difficult because the rules that they brought in a couple of years ago about organising within Unison are horrifically tight and they mitigate against people who, who don't hold positions in the union. So I think one of the things we'd want to do when we won the NEC elections is look at them rules. And... I don't want to say who's going to be on the Labour Party in this year, is it? Because I think that's exactly what we shouldn't do. I know what I think, but I think we should be saying this is the process where, the, where it's arrived at, that it'll be open and it'll be transparent. And that's the process. Because I think what we need to do to people, I think democracy is the key to everything. Not some vague democracy that Plato might want to discuss about ethereal politics, but about people, people, I know this, been a union official for 44 years, I know this, people will abide by a decision that they've, they've taken part in. That is the nature of it. I've had me say, and this is what they've decided to do. And so I, what I say to you, and I'm not giving you a politician's answer to that question, there will be an organisation, but I think perhaps the national rules need to be changed first. But but we started that process. But I think also that we need to talk about who wins what election and what the process will be. I think we would be replicating things that I don't agree with. If all I said now, who should do what? I think no stone should be left unturned in the union. And we, you know, one of the problems in some unions is so-called left officials win the elections. And they don't change a single rule. They administer the same rules that were administered against them, against somebody else. That's not the nature of the beast. The nature of the beast is, look, if in, in our union office in Huddersfield, a bloke brought in, uh, I think his dad or his uncle died, and he brought in the Huddersfield Borough yearbook for 1954, and it had a page for each service that the council um, provided. 
And it would shock anybody who's involved in Labour Party politics now. Because Huddersfield Council, which was never Labour, it was the largest authority in Yorkshire that was never Labour, had a police force, had an ambulance service, had an hospital, had dams. You know, um, Dewsbury Council had a power station. You know, local authorities were far bigger than they are now. And, but you were elected, you know, one of the problems with the health service is we need to grapple with the democracy of the health service. You know, one of the first things the Tories did was take the elected member representatives off the boards. And the hospitals can do what they want. There's no democratic process with, with which to deal with them. And we need to instill democracy everywhere. And it's interesting because one of the most cynical people about the unions and the Labour Party and ordinary working class people are careerists. They're extremely cynical. Some people can't talk about the working classes without talking down about them. And I'm talking about people allegedly on our side now. And I often use this example in union means They say, oh, working people are thick, or they don't think about things, or they're incapable of thinking about things. And I said to them, come with me to Betfred and watch somebody work in the accumulator out. Come with me and speak to somebody who works in a residential care home and watch them work in the shifts out over the next 52 weeks. Come with me to talk to somebody who's working on bonus and how they understand the implications of what they're doing against their earnings in three months' time on bonus. And working people aren't stupid. What has happened is... They, and this is part of the movement for like independence in Scotland or mayors or whatever it is. People are just crying out for some control over their own lives by some method or another. That you know, that's what a lot of middle class people didn't understand about the EU referendum. You know, there were racists in there, and there were people voting against their own interests, but there were loads of people thinking, well, whatever, something's got to be better than this. You know, if you're in Middlesbrough or Hartlepool or Oldham, you're thinking, well, I had, what benefits have I had? And nobody were answering them questions. And I think that's one of the, the key things, really, on the, the socialist left, is do you believe in ordinary working people and what they can achieve? And I've had a lot of smiles on my face over the last couple of weeks when the BBC insists on Newsnight, on BBC News, all over the shop, that however horrid some of these opinions are, they've got to be allowed to express them because we have to have balanced reporting. Oh, it's important in our charter we have balanced reporting. I've watched Match at Day for the last two weeks. There's been no balanced reporting on the European Super League. Every single... They don't allow political debate on, on them programmes, but they spend 10 minutes on each programme hammering the clubs. And it has been an education some people said, oh, people aren't interested in politics, they're interested in football. But football you know, I saw a bloke on telly the other night whose great granddad had watched Bury in the 2000 FA Cup final. And some member of his family had been on them terraces for the next 117 years. It's part of his life, it's part of what he does, and his enjoyment, his recreation, and his history. And then people, it were interesting watching it, it was an exercise in a mass movement. It was a test. Nobody saw that coming. Like nobody saw the violence against women movement or the how George Floyd in in, in uh, Minnesota would encourage demonstrations over here. And you know the six clubs that were going to benefit were as vehement. Their fans were as vehemently against it as anybody else. And I took great pleasure in showing people the Labour Party manifesto of 2017 and what it said about football clubs about pricing on tickets, about not being able to rearrange matches and paying refunds, about having two supporters, uh, trust members on every board. That This wouldn't have come as a surprise if there had been two supporters, trust members on every board. And I think we should take a lot of knowledge and, and thought into what happened on football. It isn't, wasn't about football. That, again, was people thinking, there's somebody else interfering in another aspect of my life that I've got no control over. And that's what we need to be saying to people in unison and in the Labour Party. Not that we want to decide who's going to Not that we want to decide what you're going to do, that we're going to give you the opportunity for you to decide what we're going to do. And we'll put our policies 
forward and you can vote for or not again. You can say what you want in Wakefield about whether um, the contracts from the health service should be given to private eye operators, but there's no way of carrying that situation through. There should be democratic organisations for hospitals. That's what there should be. We shouldn't have this rubbish where people are saying, I can have this operation if I live here, but not if I don't if I live there. So I, I think that, you know, Ross were really right, that, you know, we will not, I said it right at the beginning of the meeting, we will not achieve anything until we say, actually, you've got a choice in this. All I want is to put my policies forward for you to vote for. Just like the private companies don't want competition, loads of politicians don't want to be elected. If you're involved in local authorities now, everybody watching this meeting will recognise this. You know, from whatever's happening in Glasgow to Birmingham to Manchester, if they put something to a, a trust or an outside company, there's always two or three councils on the board getting the expenses. You know, what, that is the situation. We want democracy and accountability, and then we can argue his own point. That's an absolutely outstanding response. I agree with, with, with everything there. And I, I just wanted to say it was brilliant, Paul. Absolutely brilliant when you mentioned, you mentioned once and again about, about Brexit. And I know you, you've said this before, but, um, you know, you, you've got a debate. Talk about balanced reporting on the BBC. How come it, how come every time Brexit came up, the only people who were Brexiteers who were, who were spoken to in the street were outright... Um, racist why were the, the working class people who, who were voting brexit who understood socialism why were people who did not think like dennis skinner jeremy corbyn himself for that matter as a eurosceptic or, or or tony ben why were that why were those working class people not uh, being interviewed on the on the yeah, i don't want to interrupt you ross can i say something you yeah. would have thought if you watched the 2019 general election that the british economy consisted of 10 million market traders who used to vote labor but the Labour Party doesn't represent them anymore. That's all they ever want. I've never seen as many market traders in my life. Yeah, no, that 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 yeah, that that that's that, that's the better way of putting it. Definitely, and and and, and I think really there was a lot of uh, there's a lot of people on the left, and I don't really want to get into. We we could have a massive row now, right at the yeah. beginning of the end of the uh, the end of the end of the meeting. But but I think there was a real hypocrisy about people on the left um, pointing the finger at. at uh, the, the, the these market traders when 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 actually a lot of working class people might have understood a bit more yeah about the EU referendum than than those uh, yeah. people on the left who who, who were remainers yeah. in them. but anyway look that that's a bit uh, controversial but but, but uh, that, that's the point I'm getting at now let's bring Matthew back in I'm using my position of chair if anyone else wants to say anything say now but otherwise I'm going to bring Matthew in and then I think we'll we'll wrap things up after that if if, if that's okay. Hey, uh, thanks, comrades. Now, uh, just to cover a few brief free points. I mean, I, I did like the, the piece on football. As a as a Partick Thistle fan, whose club has been rescued at least once by fans with buckets outside the ground, and who and and the club, of course, has been trying attempted to to the Scottish football authorities have attempted to actually do in twice in the last twenty years. Uh, you know, and we've just been promoted having I mean, for the second attempt that they, when they did us in last season. Um, anyway, so. <laughs> I think there's two things. I mean, there's two things. I would. I think that uh, the the one of the the one key point is is accountability, and I think this this should be really very central in terms of any any reconstruction or movement or whatever else in in in, in the in the unions is 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 that people should be accountable for their actions. That that, that you know, you get a position, say, for instance, at the 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 um, the Labour Party conference a couple of years ago, where all the unions who had who had policy. Uh, in, in favour of open selection, voted against it, or in the conditions in which you know unions. I mean, most of the unions have a have policy, good policy in many cases, in favour of the Palestinians. Do they vote it? Do they do they campaign for it? Do they actually uh, you know um, protest against the, the the kind of rubbish we've been seeing from the Labour Party leadership on the question? No, they don't. You know. But, but the union officials should be held, and, and the union, you know, should be held accountable for the policy that was passed by the union. Um, you know, and the same same applies in terms of the of of, of the NEC. Uh, you know, the votes on the NEC. I mean, you know, I mean, people should. This is the problem you've got with the NEC Labour Party, is that no, no, nothing's written down. 
we don't see, I mean, what we should see when we elect people is a list of how, you, how, how have you voted in the last year? How did you vote last month? You know, you guys are supposed to represent us. But, but all, of this is, all of this is kept off, off the record. It's ridiculous. We shouldn't, shouldn't allow it. And I think the, the second question, and I think, it's, as I say, it's very it's critical in terms of organising the, the uh, organising young workers, is, is this fight to organise the unorganised and, and the battle against precarity, bad employers, bad practice, and, and of course, the, you know, the fact that they, this is a hard, hard fight. I mean, these employers will not give the basic question uh, of, 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 of recognising unions. And then, so I mean, it's not it's 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 a trench trench warfare stuff. I mean, you, you know, you can see it now. You know, say look at, at what's happening in the U.S. You know, in terms of, of, of the fight against Amazon and, and others. You know, I mean, that's here. I mean, like, you know, you can say the same about Amazon here in Fife. It's exactly the same operation. It operates like that. You know, you can say it about you know any number of. I mean, all you know. I mean, I've got, there's a whole load of, of young socialists, young socialist activists who joined the Labour Party along with me to support Corbyn, and most of them work in these jo in these jobs in which there's no, you know, I mean, it's it's a hard job just to try and get your wages out of the employer, you know, at the end of the week, you know. Never mind. And, and the, the the problem is then how, how do you bring these people together and make sure that one that, that, that they have a, you know a contract and, and all the rest of it, and that that, that you know conditions and, and, and so on apply and all this sort of stuff. And against some of the most, I mean, you know, some of the some of these employers you've got now in in, in this city, I mean, they're just vicious. I mean, you know, they're basically gangsters. That's who you're up against, and that you're going to have to fight like hell. To, 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 to put this together. And that's what young people, as you say, also with, with housing, as I say, housing is the same, you know. Um, but, you know, it's a, it's a sort of, it's a huge thing. And, and the unions are going to have to turn around and operate in a completely different way. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Matthew. Thanks for your contributions today. Thank you very much. Um, so I think we'll, uh, I'll let Paul um, respond to, to that and, uh, and also any final words, Paul. We've got 10 minutes left and then I think what's really important is two things really is, is um, uh, for us to appeal uh, to people to come forward, whether you're watching on Facebook or you're in, in actually in the meeting. Uh, if you can, uh, you can contact myself even, I can put my email address in the chat, or you can contact uh, any of the organisers in LLA, get on the Facebook. We can put you in contact with um, uh, the regional um, coordinators of the NEC campaign for Unison, because, you, you know, let, let, let's get out there, let's get the vote out there, let, let's deliver all this great stuff. I think after Paul spoke and said, I don't think anyone's in any doubt why he's remained on the NEC so long and that we, we can trust uh, Paul and the people on this slate uh, to, to, to uh, make, make these changes for, for, the, for Unison members. So uh, I'll bring you back in, Paul. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I think that if you got together the quotes of George Orwell, Gore Vidal and Oscar Wilde, you, you wouldn't need to know much else because they've all got a quote, the, the number of quotes they've got that are relevant. And one that's, that flashes through my mind at the moment is George Orwell's quote of, in times of universal deceit, telling the truth is a revolutionary act. And that is what it's like at this moment. Feel, you know, some of the things that people have said over the last year or two years that they've got in trouble for saying would have been public debate 25 or, or 30 years ago. And, and there's a reason for it. And the reason is that those who, it was economic interests and not the same as the members of the union and the members of the Labour Party don't want a different view being put forward. They don't want it. They don't want, you know, I, I remember, it didn't like this now, but it was 30 years ago, when it was budget day, every worker had the wireless at work and was shouting up and down about what happened to the price of things or the price of beer or, or whatever. And then the news would come on at night and there'd just be an array of people from the business saying what they thought about the budget. And you wouldn't see an ordinary worker interviewed about what effect it had on them because their views are of very little value. But working class people do understand. And, and I think I can't remember who said it now, but one of the questioners said it about some of these unions like in London where they've organised largely foreign workforces 
um, in areas of work that are largely privatised, like cleaning, catering, security, in universities and councils. And the unions have let them people down. And I watched attentive, attentively when, when these disputes are on, these strikes are on, what unions they are members of. And it's often not the recognised unions or unions that are affiliated to the TUC. And I think there's a lesson to be learned there. People are willing to be organised, but A, people need to know what's going on, and B, they need to be accountable. In the Now Go magazine that used to come out in the 80s, after conference, they would list all 500 Now Go branches, and then they would list next to them how each branch had voted on each issue. Now, I think that should happen in Unison's NEC. I think it should happen at the Labour Party NEC. People need to know. We don't want dark... The, the rules aren't smoke-filled anymore, but the door's still closed. We need to know what people are saying and, and, and how they voted. That is true accountability. And the turning point, absolutely right what the Speaker said, the turning point for Labour was the conference where, where the unions voted against mandatory selections. That was where everything turned around. At that point, people suddenly thought, oh God, I might have to implement these Labour Party policies or I might not get reselected. Gained a lot of confidence. And I said that um, at the time, this is a bad day. You know, the, the constituencies voted 93, 94% in favour of mandatory selection. And the unions, I think it was less than 1%. And that is where it all went. Some deal was stitched up somewhere in some behind closed doors. And some people thought they'd made a smart decision and it pulled the guts out of where people thought the Labour Party were going. And if, I, I will listen to what Ross said there about, um, and all the people say about the football. I watched a programme uh, the other night on BT, a documentary called Hours about football, O-U-R-S. And it were about football clubs that had gone bankrupt, largely around the sort of Northern Premier League type standard, and had, had died under the system that were being operated, but had been brought around by the fans. And, the, and it all involved democracy and accountability and equality. You know, one of the clubs, I think it was Lewis in Sussex, um, demanded absolute equality for men and women's football, same number of teams. You know, they paid them the seven professional players, male and female, the same wages. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. And what was really interesting from that was that both men and women's teams got the same crowds, same treatment, same wages, same facilities, same crowds, and that's what we believe in. And it's worth watching that documentary. And what we need to do is exactly the opposite of what these people. There were a cartoon in the Financial Times. I never thought I'd hear myself quoting cartoons from the Financial Times. There were a cartoon the other day, and there were two blokes in suits walking, you couldn't tell which party we were on, it didn't matter really, walking down the road with suitcases, uh, with briefcases, and one said to the other, um, I, only I only became an MP for the money you get after you've finished. And, and that was just so true. You know, when you see what's going on at the moment, you, you, we could all pick an example, couldn't we, of a leader of a political party that owes, owes bank accounts at, at 10 and 15 times what they were, before they became the leader of that political party. Now they've the, the, the retired and the contacts that they made. And, and, and we, we all can get angry about it. But the real issue, whether it's in the unions or the Labour Party, is to make sure that people who do get elected represent the interests of the... I don't mind people voting Tory and somebody representing their interests. Because the majority of people in this country their interests are better represented by the Labour Party. And the majority of people in this country, their interests are best represented by a trade union. But you can't tell people that when their living standards are falling. You know, Oscar Wilde, there's a lot of us in the gutter, but some of us are looking at the stars. And it's if when we look at the stars and say what we want for it, our socialism is about not my salary going up, so I'm all right, Jack. So everybody's salary goes up. So all the Jack and Jills are all right. Thank you very much, Chair. Very much, Paul. That's brilliant. Thank you.
so that neatly wraps things up. I just want to, uh, I, I think, you know, a massive round of applause for Paul there. He's, he's, there's, there's been so much in that meeting. Um, um, you know, all I can really say is, you know, let, talk to people, talk, talk to your colleagues, talk to people whether they're in unison or not about what we've spoken about today um, because you, you know we, we we need to get this message out and and, and, and I suppose practically speaking we want to get a return for the uh, um, we, we want to get a return for the um, for the for the left NEC slate and, and, and get unison uh, working um, fit for purpose so um just a last point if anyone in uh, is watching or or in today in the chat please join up for LLA particularly if you want to get involved in our trade union group we're, we're very committed to uh, grassroots um mobilizing in the unions everything Paul spoke about today uh, that's what we want to get across to people and, and and more importantly do so um we'll, we'll we'll finish up there um I think that's everything yeah yeah Okay, and thanks again to uh, Paul for coming along. Obviously, Paul and all Ross, the um, I think uh, Ingrid's trying to say something. Okay, go on, Ingrid. Oh, maybe she's just saying bye bye. Sorry, I just saw her waving. Sorry about <laughs> it. Well, it, as long as sorry, that, sorry, Ross. <laughs> no, as long as we acknowledged Ingrid at some point in the meeting, that's the main thing. Right, thank you very much. We'll finish up there then. Um, have a good bank holiday. If anyone's around Manchester tomorrow, come on the uh, Fire and Rehire March for the Go North West bus drivers starting in Piccadilly yeah. at 11 o'clock. Hope to see some people in uh, in the North West there tomorrow. Bye-bye. See you down, see you down there. Yeah. Bye-bye, Thanks Paul. very much, Ross. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. So, Paul, do you want to just go on unmute? Yeah. Thank you, everybody. It's very good of you to give up your bank holiday Sunday. Yeah. All right. See you later. Bye-bye. Take care, everybody.